All right. I have everyone here. Well, hello, everyone. Happy Saturday. My name is Kiana Abadi. I'm a program manager here at New American Leaders. I'd like to welcome you to our panel hosted by New American Leaders called Healing Within Confronting Racism in Communities of Color. We are very excited to be joining NetRoots Conference of 2021 and having this very timely and very important conversation as it directly affects the diverse communities that are growing here in the United States as well as abroad. I, in particular, am based out of Queens, New York, so that is where I hail from, and I am excited to have this great conversation with our amazing panelists, and I will be introducing them to you. A uh, quick agenda overview. We are going to have three questions. We've got about an hour for our panelists to introduce themselves to you all, our audience, and just to have a really thought-provoking conversation. So we encourage our audience to participate in the chat. Feel free to ask us questions. Um, we will signal to you when that time comes later, but uh, we hope you all join us as we have enjoy in this conversation with us um, as we move forward. So my first uh, panelist we are, I'm introducing is Zra Bilou, who is the Executive Director of the Council on American Islamic Relations in the San Francisco Bay Area. Feel free to wave, Zra. <laughs> and we have Papa Ja, who is the Founder and Executive Director of African Leadership Group. Feel free to wave, Papa. Thank you. And we have Ms. Alejandra Gomez, who is the co-executive director of Lucha in Arizona. Hi, Alejandra, nice to see you with us. And last but definitely not least, we have Lynn Nguyen, who is the executive director of Run AAPI. I'd like to thank my esteemed panelists and ask them to give us one minute to just formally introduce themselves and I will start backwards from the beginning. Ms. Lynn, if you could give us a minute, just your background and why this conversation is important to you. Hey y'all, hi. Thanks, Kiana. Um, I, I'm just like very honored to be here. Uh, very, very excited to dig deep into this issue. Um, so again, my name is Lynn. I'm the executive director of Run AAPI, uh, a nonprofit civic engagement organization. And we're hyper-focused on engaging with young Asian youth. Um, I'm also the social impact uh, officer for Fairfax Studios, which is a creative agency uh, based in LA. And this, this specific topic and, and my perspective in it as uh, our work is, is so anchored in the Asian diaspora is just so complex. And I'm really excited to like really dig deeper into this with y'all, um, also based in Houston, Texas. Um, uh, and specifically, and this is, and again, I know we'll dig deeper into this, um, but this issue has stayed very close to me personally when we just keep seeing the same influencers, the same celebrities, the same like Asian actors speaking on this challenge, this like, internal challenge when we know that there are just a number of incredible advocates and organizers on the ground that we're just, we're not giving spotlight to. So um, yeah, again, very, very honored to be here and uh, excited to speak more on this. Thank you, Lynn. Continuing going backwards, Ms. Alejandra, could you please answer the same question, why this conversation is important to you? Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm also deeply honored to be uh, a part of this conversation with everyone. Um, for our organization and where the fight started in Arizona, it was very clear that an attack was waged on communities of color and it continues to be. And in Arizona, I think we have a long way to go to figure out how we begin to build ecosystems that are durable, and that are rooted in having a race forward um, analysis that is inclusive of us all. I think the, the fight in particular started um, very Latino centered because um, the targeting of SB 1070 toward Latino communities. But as we have seen, um, Arizona is one of the states where the police um, disproportionately has been attacking, um, arresting, and also murdering of Black communities. And so standing in solidarity is incredibly important. 
Um, for, for us at Lucha, we operate at the intersection of economic justice and um, building an inclusive democracy. And so it's incredibly important to begin to figure out how as an organization, we can create space for these um, conversations and begin to actually make actionable the change that we need to see out in the world. Thank you, Alejandra. And uh, Papa, could you uh, please give us a uh, answer to the same following question of why this conversation is important to you? Thank you, Kiana, and greeting to all our followers. And as Kiana mentioned, uh, my name is Papa, Executive Director of the African Leadership Group. But I want to start by saying I'm, I'm an immigrant from, from Africa. And this topic is extremely important to me because I'm exhausted and I am tired as people of color and as an immigrant where in Africa we've been colonized and now to come to the United States to see also all the suffering that as black people, as people of color, we went through and continue to go through after centuries of slavery. And when you look at the surface, all this government and entity talk about human right. But in reality, when you come to in practice, we're still suffering. And one thing is clear to me, there's none of us as community of color that can address this issue in isolation. We have to come together. We have to be in solidarity to address this issue and really leading the way by the things that's relevant to us. So it's truly an honor for me to be here with all of you guys and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Papa. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Zoroff, could you please uh, give us an answer and also I am mispronouncing your name because it feels like I'm mispronouncing your name. Please correct me. You're okay. It's Zahra. Um, and I have, have shared that for a long time, I think maybe because I grew up with like white educators who would say Zahra, I just I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to respond to. So you're you're totally okay. Um, it's actually an interesting segue to the question of why, why we're here, right? Um, so my name is Zahra. I'm the executive director at CARE San Francisco Bay Area. We're an office of the nation's largest American Muslim civil rights organization. I'm calling in from Southern California today, but I'm ordinarily based in Northern California. This conversation is important to me because we have finally come to a place, I think, as communities where we acknowledge that white supremacy is deeply embedded in everything that, that we do. Um, it impacts things as basic as how I pronounce my name to others, right? I would have said Zara had had you not so kindly asked Kiana, right? I would have said it the way my 60 year old white principal said it when I was in, in kindergarten. Um, but it's not just that, it's how we interact with law enforcement, how we interact with government entities, and most importantly, how we interact with each other and what we are willing to do and sacrifice um, to advance our collective safety and liberation. Um, I, to, you know, I think to, to speak to the exhaustion, I am tired of us taking short-term wins over long-term liberation. I am tired of us putting ourselves before the collective good. Um, and I'm tired of the general unwillingness to call a spade a spade. We live in a white supremacist nation and we need to start to dismantle that um, because they're organizing. And I don't want to take the risk that they're going to out-organize us. Uh, I absolutely love that last line you gave, taking short-term wins over long-term liberation. Um, I think that's a great segue to our first question. And just to give um, some, some uh, breath to our, our audience. Um, this is obviously, of course, going to be a very heavy conversation, um, but we will, I, I, I love, as we begin to discuss, I want to, um, again, encourage the participation and engagement of our audience because these conversations are timely and important to have now so that, um, as was mentioned, we can all be liberated as a community. Um, so last year, this year and last year, quite frankly, <laughs> between the pandemic, the election, there were quite quite a many historical events that occurred um, that really highlighted the fact that we live in a white supremacist nation and, and society. Um, even within communities of color, we tend to exert uh, white supremacist ideology or ideals that we don't often immediately recognize. 
So I, I'd like to, to ask this question, starting with uh, Ms. Ms. Alejandra. Uh, how does white supremacy show up in communities of color and progressive spaces? And um, how have you seen this internalized in your community? Thank you for that question. Um, we as an organization had to do uh, internal deep dive and really interrogate the practices that we even had as an organization. What we... Um, the last four years had been incredibly grueling um, under the Trump administration and so much trauma and pain had been surfaced. Then under the pandemic, um, just witnessing what the attacks had been on our communities, being able to gain access to any type of uh, COVID relief, um, brought up more trauma and the fact that our um, families disproportionately from BIPOC communities were being predominantly affected um, by disinformation and the attacks from the right um, on accessing the vaccine. We had to slow down. And what we realized is that a lot of the practices that often we have within the progressive movement in spaces where we you know, have to fight, where we feel this urgency, um, what we were realizing is that we're replicating harm. And that those tenants actually come from a white supremacist or white supremacy frameworks, this spirit of urgency, um, the spirit of um, scarcity, and so we had to peel all the way back. And what we have done now as an organization is created space to actually have these conversations, um, to be able to build out time for our communities to um, speak about their pain, to create time for our communities to be able to have with one another, to process. Um, but also to name the harms that have been happening, particularly our organization operates within um, electoral work and the harm that we are engaging in within electoral spaces. As, as an organization also, what we have had to do is fight for our um, BIPOC communities, even at the funding level. So just to name that when when the the fight in Arizona happened and the targeting of um, Latinx communities um, as you know being undocumented and asking for papers and um, looking for people that were wearing silk shirts, right? Police. Um, what we had to do was take a step back and say that this isn't just a Latinx fight. Um, this is a fight that um, stems from policing and the police have been targeting communities of color, BIPOC communities in Arizona as a whole. But when we began to engage our um, black community partners in particular, we were getting pushback from funders. Well, are there black people in Arizona? Is there enough? Um, will their voter shares be enough? Should we really invest that much money? And what we had to do was push back. What we actually did was say, if our brothers and sisters are not included in this funder proposal, then we will not engage in this electoral program. And so it's those kinds of interventions that have made all the difference and now we have been able to lock arms with um, BIPOC-led organizations to build durable um, and scaled coalitions to last beyond just an issue and to build a framework on trust um, that has a more expansive view toward liberation instead of an electoral outcome. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Alejandra, um, especially emphasizing the need for our communities to link arms and, and really stand in solidarity for both of our issues, because oftentimes 
the narrative becomes, oh, well, immigration ten is a larger uh, Latin Latinx problem and, and blah, blah, blah. And it often gets missed that no, everyone can be an immigrant. It does not matter where you come from. It does not matter your skin color. You like migration is is natural in human in of human nature. Um, so Lynn, I, I saw a quite vigorous nodding at some points that Alejandra had made. So I'd love to uh, kind of pose the same question to you, just slightly different, um, because our, our Asian brothers and sisters had a very rough year, especially when the pandemic started. There were increased attacks against the Asian community. Um, so. I wanted to kind of get your sense on um, how have how have you been able to work against white supremacy and, and what pre best practices you can share with others on how to form multiracial coalitions to work against it? Yeah, this is, I'm even thinking even before jumping into best practices and, you know, what we've been observing um, uh, and lo looking more internal, because I, I truly feel for the first time, and especially a number of like the, the more AAPI established organizations have like finally for the first time recognized, you know, thinking, wow, you know, a lot of what we're doing is like just super white adjacent or seeking white validation. And I, I truly feel as though that, that type of internal organizational dialogue has just not yet happened until COVID hit until we saw the rise in anti-Asian violence, until the Atlanta tragedy had happened. And what I what I strongly internally feel, and this is us you know, reflecting on the work that we do in the electoral space, is that we we are still perpetuating a lot of these systems to each other internally, to our, our own Asian diaspora. And I wanted to give like a couple of very specific examples. And, and I know like my colleagues on the panel, I know, I know that y'all have experienced this too, but I will get phone calls and texts and it'll be like 9 p.m. on like a Sunday evening from API organizations asking to hop on a call, just like a quick like 10 minutes or asking for free labor from each other. And it, it's upholding these systems that we're thinking, wow, it's just how, how far along have we actually come? You know, or we're, we're curating these you know, listening sessions and these table discussions and, and finally unpacking, you know, the years of oppression and, and understanding, wow, like to be raised as a first or second generation, you know, Asian American, understanding what our parents had gone through, what our elders have gone through. And yet, why is this a table of just East Asians or just Southeast Asians? You know, and, and understanding that representation has to mean so much deeper. And so at least like going back to your question, Kiana, I when, it, when we think and reflect on best practices at this time, I, I, to be honest, don't even know if our community is at that point yet. I, I, I really don't. I, I mean, hey, live your truth. Speak that that mm. very often can be the truth. And, and actually, uh, I, I'll take this opportunity to to bring in Papa to this conversation about um, kind of posing the same question of. Uh, how we how have you been able to work against white supremacy? How has because being being an African immigrant, uh, there there's sometimes even our own discussions that we have in the Black community about understanding and recognizing the the, the immigration issue and being able to acknowledge our own internalized white supremacy uh, white supremacist values that we uplift. So I'd like to to bring you in to ask the question of. Have you been able to work against white supremacy? And, and do you perhaps any have any practices that um, might have been worthwhile for your organization in terms of dismantling these values that we internally unintentionally uphold? Yeah, thank you, Kiana. I, I, I got to admit the fact that I'm going to answer this question by being vulnerable first. <laughs> Uh, for the simple fact that as an African immigrant, I grew up in an environment where everybody looked like me, sound like me. I never knew how it felt to be a minority. I've never faced white supremacy. I never felt oppressed growing up until I came to the United States. So when it comes to this conversation early on, I, I, always, I was always the naive person that all these things that doesn't exist because I've never experienced it before until it hit me hard on my face. So what, ha what had happened is a couple of years ago, we, we had a Zoom uh, call with, with the entire community and somebody took over our system 
and was writing the end fate, the end word on my picture and was play, playing some really slur songs calling us the n-word and i was shaking and my kids was on this call and they all run toward me and start crying this was the first time after 25 years living this into this country that i first time experienced white supremacists to realize that it truly exists and i had my kids and my entire african immigrant community that experienced the same thing we were weakened, we were shaken, we were, we, were, we were scared, there was a fear, and now we had to bounce back from that. And as a leader, I did, to be quite honest with you, I did not know how to react. Are we still going to carry on on the call? Are we, are we going to end it? So I made the decision that we will not let this person or the system defeat us. We carry on on the call and did it. And I was impacted. And this took me back. The reality is I'm an African immigrant. My kids, they were born here, they are African American. They know exactly how it feels when they go to school and people make fun of their hair or people make fun of their name. And my sister Zara said it, the white supremacists are organized the same way they were organized during slavery, the same way they were organized when they were doing colonization. They are still gonna be organized. We are still in the 21st century and having this conversation when we are talking about how some people are being treated. I want to give you another example. I had a couple of friends of mine that are moving from Colorado to Washington, D.C. This is an African immigrant, and his wife is an African American. They were so scared as two black persons to take a road, road trip across the state, and they begged their white friend to take the road trip with them in the car so they can feel safe. Think about it for a minute. Two persons that want to take a road trip, but they are black, and they are so fearful to drive alone across the state. Now we talk about freedom in this country. We know it doesn't exist. Those are the reality that we are facing. Now, I mentioned it on my opening remark right now. And we see it with the police. We see it in the work environment. In Colorado, we're still facing police brutality, targeting black people. Now, how do we react? So we know and admit the fact that, yes, white supremacists exist in this country. They are organized and they're gonna be, be organized going forward. This is the time for us, we need to be organized and not let our guards down and have this tough conversation. And the black community cannot fight this alone. The Asian community cannot fight this alone. The Hispanic community cannot fight this alone. So what we're doing here, that's a good starting point but let's come up with a strategy going forward to dismantle this white supremacy that exists in this country. We are exhausted, we are tired, so, but we care, gotta carry on the fight and prepare the next generation to do the same exact thing until we are freely liberated from this nonsense that exists in this country for centuries. Thank you, Papa, for your passion um, and, and for sharing those, actually for, for all of you, for sharing those uh, very, very direct stories of your own experiences. Um, I, I'd like to bring Sahara into this conversation and actually go uh, back to the first question that I had asked, because um, I realized that I didn't get enough answers from it. <laughs> and we have a little bit more time. Um, I, I wanted to just ask you, Sahara, how white supremacy shows up in our communities or in, in the communities that you're working with and particularly progressive spaces and um, what examples of internalization have uh, you've experienced, whether, you know, however you want to frame that or whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Sure, I mean, thank you to everyone who's just been sharing so vulnerably in Papa, especially for, for sharing more about your family's experience with that. Um, with that online assault, um, you know, my answers might be a little bit all over the place, but I'll try. And it's to say that first and foremost, when when I speak of my experience or maybe the communities that I serve most directly, it's immigrant Muslims, first, second, and third generation Muslims. And the ways that I see, you know, the internalized white supremacy um, manifesting are unfortunately so broad, right? It's, we've come to this country, we wanna fit in, we want everything to go smoothly. And if we just keep our heads down and don't cause too much trouble, then we'll be okay. And those people that we see that are in trouble or that are suffering, 
Um, it's because they didn't try hard enough or because they were bad or because they broke the rules. And especially in the last year and a half, um, as so many of my fellow Americans, um, my fellow like neighbors have gone through hard times, I've seen these conversations, right? Like, why are there homeless people on these streets? Like, we don't feel safe with them there. Like, not all police are bad. We just need more diversity in in the police force, right? Like, well, we should just be glad that we have Joe Biden. It could have been Donald Trump. And so, you know, like, it's, it's better than Donald Trump. And it's like, well, no, it's still really bad. Um, and so I see that, that rhetoric and it of course informs the way people move through the world. Um, the difference, what I think of how an unhoused person became unhoused impacts how I interact with them, right? Impacts who I hold accountable for their condition uh, or for what they're experiencing the way in which I think of policing impacts whether or not I'm likely to call the police, right? I've said over and over again in my community that I'm not calling the police. Um, there needs to be blood and the consent of the person bleeding before I'm calling the police. But that's not everyone's position on policing. And of course, the way we think about politics is if the way we think about and work on politics, if what we have now is good enough, then frankly, we will lose it in 2022 because there are people who are saying this is not and we won't participate unless the rest of you acknowledge it. And then in terms of how it manifests in progressive spaces, right? It's when we hold um, different communities to different standards. Um, it's when we exclude certain communities from different conversations. It's when we choose not to take on the unpopular or intersectional fights, right? It's that short-term wins at the expense of long-term liberation. And I see it in, in the places I would sometimes expect the least is progressive spaces, right? And not just white-led progressive spaces, but people of color-led progressive spaces because the appeal of me first and my issues first and access and influence um, is here and now but the harder work takes a longer time. And sometimes we don't win favors when we take on the unpopular fights, but that's really where we test our commitment to fighting for each other. Absolutely, thank you for that, Sarah. Um, and I, I kind of wanna just take a, a quick second to try <laughs> to define some of the terminology that we're using, because I know we're in a, a very forward thinking space, but there, like, as we discuss, as we are discussing the internalization of white supremacy, I also think it's important to, I guess, try and define what white supremacy even is. And I, I forgive my panelists for, for skipping that important step. Um, but the Oxford Language Dictionary defines white supremacy as the belief that white people constitute a superior race and should therefore dominate society, typically to the exclusion or detriment of other racial and ethnic groups, uh, in particular Black or Jewish people. Um, so that is the Oxford Dictionary uh, description of white supremacy. Um, and, and I kind of want to add to this conversation the importance that the need for liberation to be intersectional. Um, and I will define that term in a, in a little bit. But uh, I've seen, we've had this recent um, media storm of the the de deportation the violent deportation of the Haitian, of Haitian migrants at the border the the abuse uh, that has been witnessed under the pretty much any presidential regime during um for against latin american women having their uteri removed without their consent um there's the there's a plethora of examples of how this system has been able not only to thrive, but to the detriment specifically to people of color. Um, and I, I just this between this past two months, you've had the, the violent deportation of Haitian migrants, but the the acknowledgement of Indigenous Peoples Day, which is the holiday that's coming up this Monday. And it, uh, you know, the passage of the um, anti-Asian hate bill that, you know, the federal government passed. So there is opportunity for, for us to, an exi to exist in a world in which 
both things can happen. We can condemn violence against, you know, migrants and, and, and Asian people. We can condemn the violence against people of color and we can uplift holidays that further uh, emphasize and solidify the, the individuals and the cultures that live within our nation. And it's a myth to believe that uh, those two things cannot coexist. Um, so I, I again wanted to to briefly share those few options, uh, those few little tidbit facts, um, and, and keep us moving forward. Um, going back to the progressive spaces that the the this group is um, sharing, I want to just ask this last question of how can we as a progressive community actually address white supremacy culture? and hold ourselves accountable to making lasting change. And um, we have an additional 10 minutes, so I hope that I can get uh, some responses from all of our panelists. And I will start with Ms. Alejandro Gomez. Man, I feel like there's so much to react to from what was being said that, um, I'll, I'll get to that question, but I really just want to say also that um, as a movement, as a whole, um, and as I've seen what this administration has done or not done, the inaction um, with Haitian immigrants, and as, you know, we're fighting for legislation and the Build Back Better, and the legislators or senators that we see that are obstructing that process, it's rooted in white supremacy. And the fact that under this administration, we are having to fight as hard for dignity for our communities as we were under the Trump administration, um, with certain legislators, particularly those here in Arizona, um, to me has really um, solidified the need to build a cross movement and build with black, brown, indigenous, Asian communities. And so, you know, as, as a proactive measure at a state level, um, elections 50 plus one strategy are important, but they're not everything the organizing, the building relationships, investing in creating spaces of learning and being able to talk about um, the harms that we even replicate within our own communities. Um, Anti-immigrant sentiment also exists within immigrant communities. Um, Anti-blackness within the Latino communities to black community is real, but we are we need more investment in those spaces to be able to have these honest conversations with one another and so one of the ways that here in arizona we have been really looking forward and trying to figure out how to build um, ecosystems that are centered in organizing that are centered in people and that are centered in liberation and not just the immediate incremental changes um, is through what we're calling Activate 48. It's a formation of a black led organization that centers black organizing, Latinx. Um, we also have an environmental organization and we're continuing to onboard new organizations that are rooted in BIPOC communities and led by BIPOC communities to begin to think about what does organizing look like? What does investment in organizing look like? And what does investment in our communities and culture change look like for the long term, the next 30 years of Arizona um, versus just these incremental victories? And so I think when we start to define what it is that we want, we will begin investing and in starting from that place versus um, you know, other strategies that maybe come from funders or that come from what's popular at the moment, it needs to come from the communities that are fighting the fights and know what their state needs. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, 
Well, Sarah, since you were last to speak last time, I shall ask you to be our second answer to uh, the same question of how can we hold ourselves accountable to make uh, lasting change and address white supremacy? I think we need communities of communities of work around this um, and we need long-term commitments. So on the communities of work, we are deeply influenced by white supremacy. We're, we are existing and moving and fighting within white supremacist structures. Even those of us that work really hard to dismantle them or want to fight them from the outside, right? We're, we are within the system. Um, and it can be really easy to misstep, um, to omit, to forget. I, I don't even always assume malice. I try not to always assume malice. And so we need communities of people that are doing this together. And this is why finding a home in the in the right organization, in the right movement space, in the right, um, you know, even friend circle makes a difference um, so that we can call each other in before we need to call each other out. And then we need long-term commitments. Um, white supremacy predates, um, you know, predates any of our, um, any of us, any of our parents. It is a long-standing system of oppression. And so as exhausted as I am, and as much as I hope that we can, you know, continue to make progress and win and see real change in the next two, four, six, eight, ten 10 years, um, I'm cognizant that, um, the people who seek to harm us are not giving up so fast. And so for me and and hopefully for all of us, this is a long-term fight. This is a lifetime commitment. Um, and I know from the short life that I've lived thus far is that we will see progress, right? We can look back now and say, look, in the last 20 years, we've moved the needle in these ways, but our work is far from done. Absolutely. There's never an end to ending white supremacy until it ends in, in entirety. Um, Papa, if you could uh, continue our conversation with a, an answer to the same question. Yeah, thank you, Kiana. Uh, let's establish the fact that the same way we are trying to organize ourselves, the same exact way the white supremacist group are organizing themselves too. And this is another reality. We know that uh, the black population in the United States is has increased by 10% since 2020. I mean, like the people of color in this country are increasing. And the right, the reality is the white supremacists are worried that at some point we will be taking over. They're organizing themselves to figure out a way how they're going to slow down or really get rid of us. Those are the, those are the reality. If you look at mental health, our community are impacted more than any other company. The COVID-19, we got more people of color dying than anybody else. If you look at drugs, all these things that are distracting uh, people, we are more impacted by any other race. Is it happening by accident? Is it happening by design? I don't know. But those are the things that we need to look at closely. One thing that I believe in deeply is if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. We are in a war, but it doesn't mean we're going to go and use it and shoot at each other. But the reality is we are in a war. We need to figure out how do we organize ourselves? How do we have more representation at the policy level where we have people that look like us, that sound like us, to represent us at this table where we can turn this policy in our favor so we can grow? I think. What we are doing even is at the smaller level, but we need to keep organizing our community. We need to keep empowering people, our community, get them to the leadership level so where policy can be changed and transformed in our favor. Absolutely. Uh, one point that I'd love to to point out for you, Papa, is, is the comment that you made about that we are at war. And I had a, a timely conversation, uh, an interesting conversation with a, a fellow organizer of mine. And their, they identify as white and their comment was that, you know, they don't want to have to fight and they don't want to have to battle and go into different silos. And I said, well, that's the white supremacist side of your mind speaking. It's easy for you to say to me, a black female, 
that you don't want to go to war because you've never had to. It, it is not, your battles are completely different from my own. And if you are unable to acknowledge that I am at war, then I cannot consider you my true ally. And I think that's incredibly important for our audience members and even ourselves to realize, like, we don't want to be at war, but it's almost as if we don't have a choice. And until we can realize this is where we are, this is what we're choosing to move from, then we can actually get somewhere. Um, we do have one question in the chat, but I do want to have Lynn answer the same question of how uh, can we hold ourselves, the progressive community, accountable and uh, what plans we can, how can we make accountable, long lasting change against white supremacist values? Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there were just so many uh, uh, like critical points that were just brought up by everyone. And I think the the one thing that I've, I, it's taken me just years to understand and internalize for myself is, is yeah, this is, this is a lifelong commitment. And I mean, the, the, the ways that it has manifested in, in not just through my work, but you know, it's, it's something as, it, I mean, this wasn't small to me by any means, but it was something as small as like finally having a very challenging conversation with my parents and like calling in their anti-blackness that for years I, I was embarrassed of, embarrassed of, I was ashamed of, I didn't recognize until I, I think it was middle school, you know, distanced myself from, from both my, my mom and my dad until I realized and, and tried to understand that for them as, as part of the boat people movement, they fled Vietnam during the fall of Saigon in the seventies. Um, and what that meant to, to come to country with having nothing, having to build something from nothing, not speaking the language, and and what that meant for their kids, and that just that just took me years, and it wasn't until the again the the unfortunate shootings in in Atlanta that you know it, it gave us space to actually talk on what that experience for them has been like, and I, I think about that often because again with with the specific work that we do in the electoral organizing space, and that you you have a lot of these multi generational. Um, uh, organizing, um, I guess it's like, I guess it's organizing and outreach, but we, we talk on the, the power of inter intergenerational conversations. And I, I, it's, it's hard not to let that go because it hits so personally, I think for a lot of us. Um, and that was like the first thing that I, that I wanted to recognize is, is just the younger generation. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm so deeply amazed by what the younger generation has inherited and, and what they're willing to do is, is just, is really amazing. Um, the other piece that I, I wanted to touch on really quickly, Kian, and I'm sure like y'all knew I was going to bring this up, but you know, some, some of the most harmful influencers and, and those that are given so much platform are oftentimes in the electoral space. And, you know, a, such a prime and, and visceral example of that has been someone like Andrew Yang, who again, had such a, a prominent uh, uh, space, not just in media and what he was doing with his presidential campaign, but you you can't have uh, uh, such a, a, a dominant figure uh, writing very public, you know, op eds claiming that Asians at this time we need to approve our Americanness. Like that's how we're going to respond in this moment. We're just going to have to prove how American we are, you know. And at the same time, you have established organizations, API organizations endorsing his race. You have well-respected Asian elected officials endorsing his mayoral race. And and I, I wanted to just like give that just a minute for thought because it's that that and like Zahra, like that that's exactly what you mentioned, that we are operating in the system in 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 such deep and profound ways that we just we don't even realize how ingrained it is in our practices every single day. You know, and so for us it's holding holding each other accountable and not being able not being afraid to do that and not being able not being afraid to take on the unpopular fights as as it's been mentioned is going to be the hardest work i feel within the asian diaspora and, and the ways that we organize within our own um because that is going to be the hardest fight doing what's what's right but it's going to feel fucking hard in the process it will mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Lynn. I, I would love to encourage our audience. Um, this is a perfect opportunity for any additional questions. Um, we have received one from Ms. Gail McNally, so thank you. Uh, what keeps all of you encouraged to continue the work? And uh, Papa, I will pose this question to you first. 
Yeah, thank you, Ms. Gale, for your question. I'm a firm believer that if you want anything done, you got to do it yourself. And especially when it comes to space, you know, we, we have to be involved. And uh, I want to leave this place a better space for the next generation than the way that I found it. And I think that that motivation, that's what keeps me going every single day. There's nothing easy about what we do, but we are all motivated just to make it a better space for the next generation to come. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And Ms. Sora, uh, asking you Gail's question, what keeps you can encouraged to do the work? I've got three nieces um, and a fourth uh, on the way. And, you know, they don't know what white supremacy is yet. I know I won't be able to shield them from it forever, but I'm hopeful that by the time they know, um, we've made more progress. And that's what keeps me going, is to ensure that the world that they grow up in is a better one than what I and so many others of us tuned in today have had to experience. And we're making progress. We are day by day, minute by minute, we are making progress. Um, Ms. Alejandra, if you could please answer Ms. Gail's question. Yes, thank you Gail for this question. Um, I would say building a pipeline of leaders and being able to have um, our young leaders have that spirit of bold disruptiveness that is what's actually changing. Um, it's organizing that has gotten a lot of these victories. While they're not the full victory that we would want to see um, or full liberation, it's that um, spirit of not enough that young people um, provide that I think is the torch that we need to continue uh, across generations so that the fight continues. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and lastly, but not least, Ms. Lynn. I mean, this, uh, thank you for the question, Gail. I mean, this is, this is definitely a question I struggle with. <laughs> Personally, very, very often, I mean, I think burnout for a lot of us is very real and it's very harmful and it has at least me questioning very often if, if this is really where my impact is is most felt, is, is in this direct space of, of organizing and, and working closely with, with Asian youth. Um, but I, I think for me, and Alejandro, you, you mentioned it uh, uh, just a minute ago, um, you know, like when, when I'm just like mindlessly scrolling through TikTok or Instagram and, and like seeing like these like just brilliant creators who are just like using very accessible platforms to speak on their truth, speak on their lived experiences and doing it in such articulate and like very like captivating, like beautiful ways is like that just always gives me a, like a moment of pause. It does it and thinking, wow, like it's it's gonna be, it really is gonna be this next generation that, that's just gonna challenge a lot of what we we currently know and how we currently operate. Um, and you see that every day. I mean, you see it from folks who just don't really care about the number of likes and how many views and um, you know, the traction that it's gaining, but they're they're doing this again to live their own truth. And that that to me just just gives gives us so many different reasons to just keep going. It's it's just it's so remarkable. It really is. Fabulous. So we are coming towards the end of our panel. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining us. And I'd like to ask our panelists, um, if you could give us your final thoughts on in, on tips for keeping the, our work going. Um, I know that for me, it will be continuing my work with New American Leaders and encouraging more leaders like yourselves to be a part of our network um, and to help us expand our, our expand our the op options and opportunities for our people like people like us to lead in these important spaces that um, we so that we can begin to have more deep conversations and and begin to to get some lifetime long term solutions to them. Um, with that being said, 
Zahra, if you could give us, oh, I feel like I, I feel like I really said your name right that time. I feel like I really got it. <laughs> um, if you could give us uh, some last last minute tips um, that you could give us for continuing our work. It's a great question. Um, take care of yourselves, right? Like everything we've talked about today is really heavy and we are in many cases directly impacted by the harms that we are addressing. Uh, we are directly impacted by the systems we are trying to fight. Um, and I've talked about, you know, this is a long commitment to work, um, lifetimes of work. And so taking care of yourself is, is key. Um, I wanna make sure that we are here and still fighting 10, 20 and 30 years from now, not because I wanna, I want white supremacy to last that long, but because I know we're still going to need to be in the fight. And so if we're burning out today and tomorrow, that's not going to be possible. So prioritize yourself as well. Um, that's not selfish. Um, it is actually the right thing to do because we can't help others if we are ourselves not well. Thank you. Ooh, yes, mental health. Because that's a whole that's another section of this conversation. <laughs> totally forgot about that. But please, you know, in addition to drinking water and eating eating vegetables, meditate. Um, so Lynn, I would love to hear your tips for us to continue keeping uh, our work going. I think what's what's oh man, and also self-care is like very hard for me to do. <laughs> but um I think for a lot of us, specifically within the Asian diaspora, really had a, 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 a has a unique opportunity to almost unlearn and learn our history all over again. I mean, for the first time, like I, I started to deeply look into and deeply understand what it means to even identify as Asian American, um, and that's that's kept me grounded in a very different way from from the the ways that direct organizing has been able to give to me. Um, so that, that's just one thing that I, I truly hope that our communities, again, are giving it space and giving it time to do is just relearning our history again. And it's, it's like, it's, it's surprising what you'll learn. Yes. Do the deep dive research. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, Papa, if you could give us some tips about keeping our work going. Yes, and, and Kiana, for the longest time, I felt alone in this space doing this work uh, and uh, until I get involved with New American Leaders, and I'm very grateful of your leadership. Uh, when I attend the New American Leader Program in Vegas, and, and that's really the time that I get to meet all the people doing the same work in their respective state, even to this uh, platform with different speakers doing things differently in different states. So I think for me, it just gets me back to appreciate the work of the new American leaders and the lead to for us to keep breaking barriers and building bridges. And the work that we do, we are more than welcome also to work with all the white people. We're not saying everybody is labeled this way. We are all able, we are all about breaking barriers and building bridges and that's the thing we need to keep doing. Absolutely. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, Alejandra, if you could uh, give us some tips about continuing our work. Um, I would say that, and this is something that we have been talking with our organizers about, that we are literally building a different world every single day. We have been living, um, existing in you know, this shell of white supremacy that feels like it just permeates and dominates our every existence. And so giving ourselves the permission to be bold, to trust ourselves and to lean into what it is that, you know, we feel we want the the world that, you know, we're, we're seeking to build, um, building, being able to feel that, see that, envision that, um, imagine it. And so I think my mind would be to trust ourselves that we're on the right path to lean on each other um, and to look to each other for support and accountability to have those call-in conversations. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, be absolutely willing to break up with whatever doesn't want to be in progress with you. Um, 
So with that being said, I absolutely adored having these conversations. I love when our organization, New American Leaders, can really pull together these minds of brilliant individuals and organizers and, uh, and organizational leaders in these spaces that we share, um, looking to acknowledge where the problems are and find poignant solutions. So again, uh, uh, Papa, Lynn, Sra, Alejandra, uh, thank you all for joining me in this conversation. Um, our audience, we thank you for joining us. Please keep this conversation going. The conversations about white supremacy, are, despite being sometimes heart-wrenching, are going to be necessary for us to really move towards, as Sahara said earlier, uh, a place of liberation, true liberation for all of our communities. Um, I did say that I was going to provide the definition of intersectionality, so I will do that briefly. It is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of dis discrimination or disadvantage. That is what we are looking for. Um, I encourage our audience to connect with our panelists, connect with new American leaders as we are dedicated to building networks and systems that lead us out of white supremacist values and uplift the communities that we so, so deeply cherish and hold dear. Um, I would love to continue to network with you all. You can follow New American Liter Leaders on Twitter. We have an Instagram. Please look up our website. Um, we would love to connect with all of you and to continue to build the next generation of leaders, um, and especially immigrant leaders in this new space. I welcome you all. Thank you for joining us and welcome you to join the next session for NetRoots. And thank you to NetRoots for having this space saved for us. Thank you for having us all. Thank you. Thank you, Kiana, for moderating. Thank you. Thank you.